9 out of 10 startups fail. Women and minority-led companies receive less than 10% of all venture capital. This is an environment designed for failure. Startup Hype Man's mission is to use the power of story to make success inevitable, not the exception. And this podcast is designed for entrepreneurs to share lessons learned from their stories so that you can figure out what whatever it takes means for your company to make it. Let's kick it. I keep getting flashed up poor connection on this. So it might be, might be why I couldn't get through. From the Hype HQ recording studio in Chicago, Illinois, it's Startup Hype Man, the podcast. I am your host and the Startup Hype Man, Raj Nation. Every week we bring you real talk and unpack the behind the curtain strategies with the entrepreneurs who are doing it or who have been there, done that, all to help your startup grow up and stand out. Join the Hype Nation to catch every new episode, plus get resources and other stuff that actually help you, not the whack promotional junk that other companies try to shove down your throat. All you have to do is add your email at startuphypeman.com. Ready for some real talk? Time now for me, Raj Nation, to turn it over to, well, me, Raj Nation, for this week's conversation. Yo, 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 welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Startup Hype Man, the podcast. Today on the show, we've got Richard Davies joining us from all the way from across the pond in London. Richard is the founder of Twickets, which is an ethical ticket resale marketplace. Now, doesn't that sound interesting and exciting? Basically, what that means is if you've ever had to go to a concert or a sports game and you've paid way too much on the resale market, Twickets is here to get you a resold ticket at face value. Yes, I said that right, at face value. Twickets has amassed 750,000 users on its platform and been officially endorsed and supported as the official music platform or resale platform by the likes of Ed Sheeran, the Foo Fighters, Mumford & Sons, Elton John, and more. Lots to talk about today. Richard Davies, thank you for joining the show today, or welcome to the show, I should say. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thanks. Now, our topic is how do you build trust with your customers. Can you tell me why is this on your mind? Why is this important to you? Well, I think it's important because um, you know the whole reason we we came to be really is that is the lack of trust that existed in what's called the secondary ticketing market, the the platforms where you can buy and sell tickets um, at inflated prices for shows uh, that generally are dominated by scalpers or professional brokers. Um, they are set up really, uh, in essence, as a, as a fan-to-fan service, but but they're absolutely everything uh, apart from that. So uh, I think there's a hell of a lot of distrust in, in those services, and we felt that it was time for a trusted, transparent alternative to the secondary market that was about serving genuine fans uh, and for genuine fans to trade with one another and cut out the scalper. Yeah, I don't think you'll find one fan of anything that involves a live event in the world who would disagree with you on that front. (laughs) Uh, So I think this will be a really interesting conversation and a topic that I know I'll get a lot out of and definitely our listeners will as well. Before we get into the thick of that conversation, I want to learn a little bit more about you. Now, um, tell me, where did you grow up and how do you feel that impacted or how did that shape you becoming an entrepreneur in the first place? Uh, I grew up in London and I guess I just saw in, in you know, in London, a, a lot of people uh, set up businesses, run uh, startup brands. And, and, and this is obviously pre dot com days uh, before the internet. Even um, I, I really envied what they did and, and it, it was happening all around me. London was a, buzzing place right, when I was growing up and, and I wanted to be part of that and I always aspired to, to run my own business. Now, this is a, I'm going to sort of show my hand here in our age difference, but you said in the pre.com days, now, yeah. were they still called startups at that point or were they just called businesses? I think they were just called businesses. Okay. <laughs> there <laughs> was no such thing as a startup. Yeah, I always wondered when that terminology came around. <laughs> so, you know, so entrepreneurship seems to be something that is just like pulsed through your veins um, throughout your entire career. Did you have like in your own family, were there any entrepreneurs you were looking to? No, none. That's, that's what's strange. I don't know where it came from, but I, I just had that that feeling within. There's so many other entrepreneurs 
will, will describe. You know, you, you just you knew that that's what you wanted to do. And it's not that I started off life. You know, I went to university. I, I, I got into a job. Um, I had a, a, an interesting career in the music industry uh, in my early 20s, but there was still that burning ambition to work for myself, which I subsequently then did. Yeah, and if it didn't run in the family, then did your family say you're crazy when you first stepped into entrepreneurship? Oh, yeah, they, they, they thought I was totally crazy. <laughs> so, um, you know, they, they couldn't understand why I was working in the music industry to start with, but then actually setting up my own business was, was one step too far. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to sort of like over the next couple of minutes here, build the path towards Twickets. And you mentioned, you know, stepping into the music industry, which that's really like where you've chosen to reside your entire career. Um, you co-founded a company called iCrunch back in 1998, which was Europe's first legitimate music download service. And that's pretty big deal, right? At a time when we're, everyone's still on dial-up modems. Can you talk through maybe quickly just what made you say, hey, there's a market need for this and there's actually like technology to match? Well, I've come out of the music industry, as I mentioned earlier, um, and I just felt that the internet was offering something so incredibly exciting in terms of distribution of music, uh, opening up all sorts of new channels for artists uh, to reach fans. And downloads had started to sort of come to the fore, the, the, the Rio uh, player had come to the market, uh, there had been the launch of a few services uh, in the US, including eMusic, um, but there was nothing serving the UK artists and the UK audience, and, and in fact, Europe as a whole, uh, it, to that end. So, so we looked at launching that, and indeed we did, uh, with the backing, funny enough, of eMusic. eMusic backed and invested in that company, as did AOL at the time. Well, when you say AOL, I think we all think of the dial-up modem, or at least the... Uh door closing sign when someone signs online and, and the you've got yeah. mail now can yeah. you just uh, you know again 1998 how long does it is it taking to download I, I from my memory if i even downloaded anything in 1998 it probably would have taken over an hour to download one song right yeah yeah it, it was taking a while yeah i think you're on the right lines there it was it was that that sort of ballpark the interesting thing though that i think with sort of the timing of that is the world didn't know any better, so right, an hour didn't actually seem like that big of a deal. You just kind of hit the button, you go and like make dinner or do whatever you need to do, and you come back to your computer when it's ready. Absolutely, and I, I think it was just the sheer incitement of the fact that you could download music directly to your PC. You know, yeah. the fact you could even do that was was astonishing. <laughs> So you continue on. Uh, so uh, Music Choice ends up selling, or excuse me, uh, iCrunch ends up selling to Music Choice after a few years. Uh, you spend a little bit more time on the technology front, uh, getting into sort of uh, digital agencies in that sense. And then that brings us, you know, basically that takes us for a long time uh, up to February 2015, which is when Twickets gets founded. So can you give us sort of the overview here and you did a little bit in the introduction but just if someone walks up to you and says what is Twickets what's your answer uh, it's a an ethical ticket marketplace so it's the ability to sell a ticket at the original value of that ticket only no more um, obviously people can sell it less but no more than face value and it's to enable fans to trade genuinely with other fans for uh, re life reasons when they can't attend the show they're ill uh, their plans change, they go off the band that they bought a ticket for six months earlier. If they want to sell that ticket on, they can through our service, but only at the original price. And uh, our view is that most fans buy tickets to attend the show, not to make money from it. So when they can't go, their first motivation is clearly to get their money back. But the second motivation is to actually ensure someone going in their place um, is a genuine fan too. So that's what we tap into. Yeah, and I think you'll see that um you know, oftentimes the first thing someone does is they text their friends and say, hey, I can't go to this. Does anyone want my ticket? I'll sell it to you for face value. Um, and then when those friends can't, they will. It's almost like then they hit the secondary market to say, OK, well, I guess I'll just make money off of this then. Right. So yeah. I, to me, it's almost just like expanding that group text message to the entire music listening universe. Well, it is. We, we started on Twitter. And, and the reason we started there is because we were seeing certainly in Europe. Uh, Twitter being used by uh, event goers as a means to uh, sell their ticket on when they couldn't make a show to their immediate network. 
Now, clearly, you know, the average number of uh, followers on network is is limited. It's about 100, 140 these days. So the chance of you selling your ticket to one out of 140 people is not that great. So what we did is we aggregated those that inventory uh, and set up an account for everyone to follow so that you'll, you could reach a much broader audience when you're looking to sell your ticket through Twitter. So as you said, it's a bit like it's sending a text message, really. Now, for the people listening, you know, so far you've said you can sell the ticket at face value. When we first got introduced, you know, one of my initial questions, which I'm bringing it up again here because I'm sure the listener is thinking this too, is, well, if you're just selling it at face value, where does Twickets make the money? Can you talk through sort of the business model aspect of that? Sure. So we uh, charge the buyer of the ticket a standard booking fee, as, as you would pay at any uh, primary ticketing agency or box office, you would pay a booking fee. So we don't charge the seller to sell that ticket. They sell for free, and that's our commitment to them for selling at face value. But the buyer pays a fee of typically 12 to 15% of that ticket price. And that price alone, just the fee itself, compares favorably to the secondary market where you can be paying 30, 40, 50% of the, the inflated ticket price. So we're charging 12 to 15% on the um, capped value, face value. Yeah, so so uh, for example, um, let's say you were going to a concert in the United. Let's say you were going to a Beyonce concert in the United States. If you had bought a ticket for seventy dollars and you could no longer go to the show, and you put this up on Twickets, um, essentially the buyer would be paying s- roughly eighty dollars for the ticket because seventy dollars plus the essentially like the service fee uh, tacked onto that. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we've got a really good understanding of the platform. You know, again, I, I think this is it's very cool that this is what you've put your effort and energy into. And again, you've amassed a pretty big audience for this. As we said in the introduction, 750,000 users endorses the official, tic- official ticket reseller by Ed Sheeran, Foo Fighters, Mumford & Sons, Muse, The Pixies. I think there's even more. The list goes on and on. Uh, Elton John even, right? So... Yeah. Our topic then, let's dive into it. It's on building trust with your customers. So you talked about it in when I first asked you why it's on your mind is that it was sort of crucially important with this particular market to build trust. So take us through sort of your mental process when you look at building out this platform. How does trust first come into the picture? Okay, well, I think, as I said earlier, you know, we, we had to build trust. For this to work, we, the, the, the uh, audience had to believe um, in the proposition and uh, we had to be totally transparent in the way we operated and we achieved that transparency and trust through a number of different ways um, the first and most and probably most important thing of all is actually getting the support for what you do from your audience so it's it's really building word of mouth because without word of mouth you're nothing and, and, and all our growth pretty much over the years has been consistently through strong word of mouth across social platforms, but also offline, recommending tickets to your friends as a place to sell or buy your ticket. So so that is so crucial to us in terms of building trust in what we do is, is it comes from the user. Now, on the artist side then, how are you, like the, the user side, yeah, right? I see that on the artist side, what was the value prop to them? Well, that was really to protect their fan base from being um, scalped, from being ripped off, because they no artist wants to see their fan pay over the odds for a ticket. They, they price their ticket uh, according to the type of audience they're looking to attract. And what they don't want is someone then using that ticket price to uh, profiteer. And uh, they, as a result of seeing what we did and seeing the success we were having, through those early stages of growth, uh, came on board and started to endorse us and, 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 and promote our services. In fact, they went as far as, as you've mentioned already, as, in, as, uh, as far as partnering with us um, to, to actually act as their official resale channel for their shows. So we've worked now with over 250 artists, festivals and venues, all seeking to end the practices of the secondary market. And uh, they're doing a great job in terms of helping push this 
alternative channel along. Now, we're not here to, to stop scalping. We're not claiming we're going to end scalping. That's not our position. What we're saying is we're offering an alternative way to market your ticket should, should you not be able to attend the show. And and what you said there with the artists, like they don't want to see their fans get ripped off. That's something that I think, I mean, I've noticed here more recently, you know, locally in Chicago, uh, Chance the Rapper is like our local hero. And yeah, we've spoken to his management, yeah. Very cool. And and yeah. he, you know, I think last year or two years ago, he held a concert at one at the baseball stadium here and he found out that there was so much reselling going on that he was personally like buying back the tickets from the scalpers and then selling them at face value back to the fans. So I yeah, definitely so see like the artist movement going in that direction. Yeah. But yeah. I'm well aware of that story. It's incredible. So uh, yeah. And that, that really um, epitomizes what, what this is about. You know, so many artists now are getting on board to try and stop uh, the profiteering around their tickets and they're doing it in a number of different ways. You know, in, in the UK, they've got together to form uh, an alliance called Fanfare, uh, where they're putting pressure on some of these secondary platforms to uh, to cease trading. Uh, and they're putting technology in place to stop the tickets from being transferred on those platforms as well. So I think it's, there's a concerted effort across the board and around the globe to, to curb the practices of secondary ticketing. Mm -hmm. So, so far you have mentioned the audience had to believe in the value proposition. We had to be totally transparent with them. What sort of comes next in your decision-making process, whether it's we need to do this or actually like tactically, like, you know, technology-wise, we had to build this into it? Yeah, well, I think the, the key thing really next was to build a, a robust and safe uh, and secure service because without that, it doesn't matter what early support you have, it'll quickly fall away. Uh, so we moved from being a Twitter-only business or, or, or facility to a transactional website and app, which then meant that the transaction had to go through us and anyone abusing our terms of use would then have the transaction reversed and, and they would be blocked from using the service in future. Now, I have to say, we, we don't see a, lot, uh, a great deal of uh, bad practice on the platform. I think those that tend to want to make money through their tickets were not going to come to Twickets and sell at face value. They'll go somewhere else. But nevertheless, we needed to show to the user, both the seller of the ticket and the buyer, uh, that we were protecting them. And in those cases where there has been uh, fraudulent activity, I said very rare, but where it has happened, we're able to step in now and provide that service to reverse, reverse what went on. And so on the technology side of things here, you say you had to build a robust, secure, safe service. Yeah. What are the key things you're looking for within that? Because... You know, I, I think any tech company is saying, yeah, we got to make sure our platform is safe and secure. But in, the, in your specific case, what are the levers, I guess, you're looking to pull? OK, so we have we have a number of different approaches to this. And, and I would I would like to to state here that we'd probably spend more time managing the uh, view of transactions than any other ticketing company does in the world, because we, we care so much about what happens here and our reputations on the line. So. So what we do is we've invested heavily in technology to ensure that we can track usage patterns, buying and selling patterns. We can link that to social media behavior. and uh, we, we can look for checks to see whether someone is a genuine fan or not uh, and whether the ticket is genuine or not, particularly if we've got an integration with the event and the, the primary ticketing system. We also have a lot of manual input going in here as well. So every ticket that's listed on our service is manually checked before it's listed. And we will manually check the user that is listing it and, and uh, buying that ticket as well if, if, if it's needed. So really, I mean, it's about going the extra, well, I, I won't say mile because you're, you're in the UK. So it's about going the extra kilometer, right? <laughs> I know we're miles as well. Okay. We are miles still. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it's, it's, it's going the extra distance on this stuff because I think it's easy to build the bait, like the minimum requirements and be like, OK, we're good. We can focus on the marketing now. Or we can focus on some other part of our business. But you're really taking it a step further and saying like baseline is not good enough. We have to make sure we are one of, if not the best at this safety security side. Yes, absolutely. We, we 
it's an arms race, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but it is an arms race that we, we are facing some very smart people out there who will, who will look to, to buy up tickets using bots, uh, using all sorts of other techniques to, to hoover up tickets on an industrial scale, particularly on the primary market. So we need to make sure that we're protected from that type of activity as well. So we're continually investing in technology. Uh, you know, we have uh, bespoke systems in place that will... Uh, that are continually being worked on uh, to ensure that we have as fair trading policy as we possibly can achieve. Yeah, the bot buying is so interesting because it's like you could build a platform for ethical reselling, but then if those tickets just get bought by someone who runs a script to buy 100 tickets at face value and then resell them on another site, it's like, you know, what's yeah. it all for at the end of the day anyway? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's 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 refreshing to hear that you're addressing that out of the gate. So we have... You know, get the audience to believe the value proposition, be totally transparent, build the robust, secure, safe service on the technology side. What's next for you when you look at the the buyer trust or the user trust journey? Well, I think it's supporting a fair pricing model. I, I, I talked a little bit about this earlier as well, but looking at how we can price this to to the user such that it's it's fair. And everything is transparent about it. So, so I mentioned previously that we allow sellers to sell for free and that our buyer's booking fee is, is standard uh, versus the primary market. Uh, but we also don't uh, charge markups either on any other services that we, we, we provide. So, for instance, the delivery of the ticket, sometimes if, it, if the ticket's physical, it has to go from, from the seller to the buyer direct, often, let's say, by post. We don't mark up delivery charges either. So there's no hidden extras here. What, what we charge for is, is our service through the booking fee, and everything else is passed on at cost. Why do you think that, you know, and whether it's tickets or otherwise, because there are other, you know, technologies people buy that have this going on as well, where, why do you think it's so attractive to bury extra fees within a cost? Um, you know, because again, it's, it doesn't just happen in the ticket thing where you you yeah. see your ticket and then you end up to, at the at the checkout cart page and it's all of a sudden twenty five dollars more than what you originally saw. Um, yeah. You know, obviously, you know that happens in sometimes with flights too. But then even there are you know there are like SaaS tech products, there are things you know B two B products where you think it's one price, but then it ends up being you know a little bit or exorbitantly more. Why do you think that's such an attractive thing for companies to want to do? I guess it's just so easy to implement. You know, it's, there are so many extra revenue streams you can add into the buying process, and, and I think unfortunately some people have used that that, that uh, technique. So, you know, we've seen it as well here in the UK and Europe. You know, we, we, it's this drip feed of extra charges as as you move through the process, and I think they rely on the fact that people get so far down the line that they don't actually want to jump out of that transaction so they just accept those extra charges i think it's abusive behavior at times and and it, it shouldn't be allowed well yeah and and definitely it is something that you know if you can say oh wow i can make 20 30 dollars or pounds more per print per transaction and then if i'm doing this many transactions in a day or a month right it makes so much more money so how do you i guess how do you know knowing that the that that is a very big upside. How do you sell yourself on taking the alternative option, which is we're going to make less money per transaction? Like what's what's the short and long term well, benefit is, then? The alternative is to make more transactions. You know, and that that's what we're about. We by building that trust and by attracting the users in the way we do, uh, and and driving growth through endorsement what we're finding is we're seeing more transactions. So we're very much about the long tail. Last year in the UK alone, we ticketed for 25,000 events. Uh, so that's a pretty long tail. That's a pretty large number of events. And if we can continue to grow the number of people trading for those events, then that's that's where our success comes from without ripping off the consumer. Mm. Can you talk through, and so now to recap, I've got, uh, get the audience to believe in the value prop, build a robust, secure, safe service, support the fair pricing model. Now, is there a step four in this or do you feel those are the three yeah, primary there is. things? No, I think there's, there's more to come. Um, it's, it's involving your user base, I think, in, in your in your business and your service. And it's really important. So one of the things we did early on 
is to seek their collaboration. So when they're using our service and they see a ticket they feel is overpriced or someone acting against the terms of our service to report it. So we have a report button against every ticket that's, that's published in our app and on the website. Uh, you can then uh, click on that and tell us if you think that ticket's overpriced and we'll investigate further in, in case something slipped through the net. Mm. Added, to, added to which, we've also involved our users in our fundraise activity. So we undertook a crowd fundraise a couple of years ago where we had almost a thousand of our users actually invest in the business. So they are co-owners of the business. So I think it's important to get those your audience involved in, in your, the growth of your business. And, and, and those are two, just two examples of the way we've done that. I like that a lot. Get them involved in the growth of your business. It reminds me of... Uh, last season on this show, we had Matt Wilson, who's the co-founder of a company called Under 30 Experiences, a, a close friend of mine. And our, our conversation in that episode was on building a community um, with your customer base. And it's 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 similar line of thinking, um, doing more, basically involving them beyond just their direct transaction with you. How do you, how do you get them involved uh, in additional yeah. ways? Well, if they're part of it, then they feel more trusting in, in the product and they're more likely to tell their friends and, and colleague, work colleagues about the service. And I think it's so important these days to, to, to be able to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we involve the user base. What next? Well, I think the final thing really is offer great customer service. You know, we have to uh, be there and available for the customer as and when they have a problem. Uh, too many, on too many occasions now when I've been using online services, it's, it, the, the customer service element is buried somewhere within the site. You can't find where to contact anyone or speak to anyone to solve the problem you have. And that clearly, you know, in a fast moving world like the event space, uh, people can be buying a ticket on the day of the show and they'll need to know, they'll need an answer uh, to an important question relating to that show or relating to their ticket. So we need to be on hand 24 seven pretty much to, to answer those questions. And, and we have an average response time now of less than an hour uh, per issue raised. So I'm, I'm proud of that fact. I think that really is, has been important as well in terms of growing the business. Now, one thing I want to actually clarify with that um, for the listeners, um, if you've been listening throughout this season and you remember we had recently, we had AJ Gull on the show who talked about scaling your company with minimal customer service. Please remember that his advice coming out of that episode was that model works if you have built a business or a platform that does not require a lot of customer service. If it is something that, yeah. um, like in his case, it's a B2B product. The users already inherently know what they're looking for and want. They just needed like something to execute on it. So mm -hmm. the need for customer service is not as high. Whereas in your case, day of event, people are panicking and people need to know that the, the yeah. site that they have put all this trust in is there for them. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But at the same time, we're, we're a marketplace, we're peer to peer. So actually, most of the issues get dealt with between the buyer and the seller. We only have to step in if something goes wrong. And we find that in 99% of the cases that the transaction flows through easily, uh, particularly if we've got an integration with the event as well. So the ticket can be validated and, uh, and, uh, cancelled a new ticket reissued and goes straight to the new owner without our involvement. And uh, therefore, the customer service need you know, isn't a problem uh, and we can scale with it. Last question here before we wrap up. Can you talk through how you went about approaching some of these big acts, right? Like it, it's not like Ed Sheeran at gmail.com. I mean, I don't know, maybe that's his email, but, but uh, you know, it's not like they have publicly available email addresses. What was your strategy to get an in with these artists or with their management groups? Well, the strategy first and foremost was, was to tackle the problem that, that was, that was frustrating everybody, both fans and industry alike. And we did that with, with a fans first view of life. So we built something that fans could use and um, that uh, as the alternative to the secondary market, that was fair and transparent and trusted. And once we started to see some growth in the service, uh, we then took it to some people within the industry to show them what we'd achieved. And, and we, had, we got a great response. I think if we'd have gone there early days and said, look, this is what we're, we're planning to build and are you behind this? We might have had a different response because I don't think that they would have necessarily believed it was possible for this to be a success. But the great news is that 
that fans have made a success. They, the fans wanted something different. It's, it's never going to appeal to every single fan, but sufficient numbers of fans have got on board with what we do, have supported it and used it and recommended it. And artists have recognised that and they've seen that this is actually something that is growing with natural momentum and they're doing everything they can now to support it. So then was it... Um was it a case where the fan usage got so high that the artists just saw it and were contacting you or you were, you were like, Hey, we've got a huge user base here. We'd love to have you endorse this platform. No, in, in early days, it was us going to them. Uh, now it's very much artists contacting us saying they want us to work with them on their next tour. So yeah, it, we, we went knocking down doors, at, you know, in, in the first year or two of operation uh, trying to explain to people what success we were having, how it was going, and, and why this is important. And slowly but surely, they came on board. And now, um, as I said, we, we, we actually hear more from them than, than we have to contact mm. uh, the other way around. And were you going direct to artists those early days, or were you going to their A&R, the management group? Management, management and agents really are, are the most important people in, in our uh, world. You know, they, they're the people responsible for the talent, both in terms of managing their day to day activity and, also, and booking their live shows. So, so that's where we start. But it doesn't mean to say we don't have some direct communication with artists. We do. Uh, we also work with the promoters on the shows. We work with record labels. We work with a whole host of different people, venues. Uh, but really, the manager and the, and the agent are the, are the key decision makers. And was it as simple as sending an email saying, hey, we've built a fair ticket resale marketplace? Um, probably not quite as simple as that, but, but it, was, it, it wasn't too difficult to sell because, it, as I said earlier, it's, it's a problem that everybody wants to see tackled. So when they saw a solution that, that had the ability to grow, they got behind it quite quickly. Very cool. Before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know and and to my knowledge, Twickets has not reached the U.S. for events yet, but it's on the way. Is that right? We are actually launched in the U.S. now. We we have we only launched recently though, so um, j just last year. Uh, we're working with a few acts in the U.S. at the moment: Eric Church, uh, the Foles. Uh, we've worked with uh, we're working with Elton John and Queen actually on their U.S. dates as well. So a mixture of U.K. and U.S. acts. Okay, very cool. So where can our listeners find Twickets online? Where can they find you and get in touch? Well, if they go to twickets.live or contact me on info at twickets.live, uh, mark it for my attention and I'll, I'll happily get back to anyone that, that wants to get in touch. To wrap up, we will close the episode the way we finish every episode, which is by each giving our sort of our top line response to today's topic question. I'll go first and then I'll let you close it out, Richard. So the topic today was... How do you build trust with your customers? As I look at the advice you shared, to me, the thing that jumped out the most was having a believable value proposition. Uh, I think so many companies get this part wrong, which makes the sales that much harder down the road because they're just saying the wrong things. And then the other thing that jumps out to me is not just having the value proposition, but you as the creator have to believe that yourself to the extent the extent to which you've built the platform around that value proposition. And like in your case, you said, like we had to have a fair pricing model that actually supported what we were saying we were trying to fix. Yeah. Richard, your top line advice, takeaway response for how do you build trust with your customers? I think it's it's totally about transparency. I think you have to go in with with you know, showing everything to to the consumer that you know, you're about and passionate about what you do, obviously. But but also at the end of the day, being totally transparent in in, in your entire offer uh, and having a team that fully supports that model as well, which which we we do here. You know, everyone believes in in what we do. Everybody wants to fix what is a uh, a, a difficult issue for the fans and, and industry alike 
Richard Davies, founder of Twickets. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you very much. That brings us to a close. Did you like what you heard? Did it tingle your earbuds? Support your startup ecosystem and share this episode with another founder to help them. If you don't have anyone in mind, then leave a rating and review of the show on iTunes so more entrepreneurs can learn about it. And if you want more, head to startuphypeman.com and click on the knowledge section to get a bonus blog post written by this week's guest where they unpack the topic even more. Remember to subscribe to the show on iTunes or Spotify or Google Play or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Startup Hype Man is more than a podcast. In fact, we support startups across the United States and globally, develop sales and marketing acumen with messaging that stands out to customers and stands apart from competitors. Learn more and fill out a form at StartupHypeMan.com if you want to chat. Shout out to this week's guests for spending their time with us and shout out to music artist Sir the Baptist for providing our show's theme song. Catch you next time. Hype Man out. Word up. Raise up. Got you howling at the moon. Yeah. This is dance with the devil, girl. Instead of sundown, too. Yeah. This is dance with the devil, girl. Tell me what you're gonna do. This is dance with the devil, girl. And if you can't get a loose, then you fall into the truth. It got you howling at the moon. Yeah. This is dance with the devil, girl. Instead of sundown, this is dance with the devil, girl. Tell me what you're gonna do. No, this is dance with the devil, girl. And if you can't get a loose, then it's, it's a dance with the devil.